Hmm. What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to the channel and my spoiler-filled review of the first episode of The Mandalorian Season 2. Now, I always approach these Disney Star Wars uh, projects with a little bit of trepidation. There's always this little thought in the back of my head that Disney is going to find some way to kind of shoehorn some stuff in to make the sequel trilogy make more sense. Like last season when we had, you know, the child heal grief Karga. And then I was like, well, well, that's weird. The force healing, force healing. That's never happened before. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. You know, and then we got the rise of Skywalker. and We're like, oh. You know, I'm just worried that at some point we're going to have the camera sort of pan through some old Imperial outpost and you're going to catch a glimpse of Palpatine in the back with a couple test tubes, you know, making Snoke. Well, thankfully, in this episode so far, none of that has happened. The same quality you've come to enjoy from the first season is here. And uh, I got to say, they turn it up a notch. Not only in the visuals, but in the length of the episode. This is a 58-minute episode, almost a full hour. And that's a good 10 to 12 minutes longer than the longest episode from last season. And it was time not wasted. I gotta say, as the entire episode sort of played out, I, there was maybe three or four times where I thought, okay, they're gonna wrap it up, and we're gonna... No, oh, they're, oh we're gonna keep going. Yeah, well, okay, well, they're gonna wrap it up here. No, we're gonna keep going. And, uh, and it didn't really feel like it dragged on. I felt like everything sort of played out. I felt like we were able to sit with some of the characters and some of the situations and, and see those things play out. You tend to build a lot of tension if you sit with characters in a situation and there's no dialogue. You know, There's a stare down that happens that perfectly illustrates that point. So in the beginning of the episode, we see that I think this is taking up right where we left off with season one. Maybe there's some time that has gone by. Um, you can assume that Mando has followed... Uh, some clues to this planet, maybe that planet, and he's uh, tracked this guy down. He's going to try to get some information about where are the other Mandalorians. One thing I was really happy to see is that most of the stuff that we saw in the teaser trailer was in this episode, in the beginning of this episode. So that's great because that, to me, tells me there's so much more story out there that we we have no idea. We've just scratched the surface, and uh, and that's good. I don't want to be spoiled. I wanted my little teaser and now we're going to see all this footage and then we're going to move on to brand new stuff. That's a good thing. And there are more than one example of show me, don't tell me. At the end of this sort of, uh, this fight, this conflict they have in the very beginning of the episode, he strings the main bad guy up and says, listen, I'm not going to kill you. You will not die by my hand. Gets the information out of him, walks away and okay, he's walking away. He let them strung up you think okay maybe he's going to cut him down or or maybe he's just going to leave him swinging uh but no he he shoots the light out as he leaves and i thought that was kind of weird and then all of a sudden you see these red-eyed creatures sort of just pop out of nowhere you know you just see their eyes and their shadowy figures and they jump out and they eat the guy you know or you you assume that they eat the guy because they don't tell you there's no dialogue there's no uh somebody saying oh don't go out at night because the gremlins will get you you know none of that it just sort of happens and it plays out and you see it and there's no dialogue that addresses it but you know what's happening that's nice because we want to leave a little bit of mystery in our science fiction some of the best things about star wars star trek and these other things uh, is that, that there is a little bit of mystery one of the bad things that i can say about the prequels is that it it showed us everything that there was to see about vader and i don't know that i wanted all of darth vader explained but i still love those movies and so based on the information he gets from the bad guy, we're going back to Tatooine. <sighs> yes, I know there is a reason at the end of the episode why we had to go back to Tatooine, but I don't know that even that little teaser at the end necessitated us going back to this planet. We have seen this planet time and time again in the movies, and, and I just think that this is a season two. You've obviously got more money. You've got hour-long episodes. Why can't we go to another planet? He runs into the same female mechanic that we saw in season one, and that's fine. I, I, that character doesn't really bother me. I like the way that she sort of gravitates towards Baby Yoda, you know, and which we all do. And this is where we get a really cool Easter egg. At least I think it's an Easter egg. I'm not sure. If you look at this picture here, you'll see that this R5 unit is actually the same unit that had a bad motivator in A New Hope. At least I think so. I, I'm not 100% sure on this, but as as the R5 unit sort of comes into frame, you see the top of the of the droid, and I think it's the second red square to the left, has uh, some oily or burnt residue around the square, which kind of... 
allows you to assume that that was where the bad motivator failed and it was repaired, and this droid ended up working in some, you know, space hangar in Moss Eisley's. At least, that's what I want to believe. So he heads off in search of this, uh, of this, this supposed Mandalorian and a part of Tatooine that, uh, that we haven't really seen before, which I thought, well, at least that was kind of cool. It's the same planet, but at least it's a different area that is rumored to be completely desolate. And I like the scenes where he's actually meeting with the Tusken Raiders and he's, you know, you see that he can actually communicate with them and it, it feels like more of a journey instead of just going from point to point to point to point. It looks like he's trying to find his way, you know? I love the way he rolls into town. It really was... It really was a lot like those old westerns, those Clint Eastwood movies where the lone gunman sort of rides into town really slow and all the townspeople look at him, you know. Um, Mando walks into the bar, asks if there's anyone here that looks like me, and uh, the barkeep says, well, the, the marshal does. And we turn to the left and we see the marshal coming in and he is actually wearing Boba Fett's armor. Now we quickly see that it's actually not Boba Fett, it is Timothy Oliphant as the marshal. Mando demands that he gives them the armor. They had this cool little stare down where you see two guys that are, you know, maybe going to have a little shootout. And then all of a sudden, a, a sandworm rolls through town. I thought that was kind of weird. You know, we haven't heard anything about sandworms on Tatooine. I mean, maybe there was some stuff in the EU, some of the books. But as far as I'm aware, there's nothing said about this in any of the movies. And which to me is fine. A planet is big. There can be a species that exists maybe on one half of the planet that isn't on the other half. But, you know, that's the benefit of going to a different planet. If they went to a different planet, I would not think anything of it. But since we're back on Tatooine and you're going to go add new stuff to an established location, these questions are going to be asked. So to avoid that, how about we go to another planet? So the marshal seems to be a reasonable guy. He says, "Listen, I will give you the armor back if you help me kill this uh, the sandworm. It's been uh, it's been destroying crops and animals, and it's just a matter of time before he eats the whole town." So they have to join forces with the uh, with the Tuscan Raiders, which you know, it's a uh, it's kind of a trope uh, storytelling element that we've seen before, but. I think it works. I didn't get a lot of SJW vibes here, but basically you have these two groups of people that are separated by war, conflict, and differences. They have to come together to fight a common enemy, and in doing so, they form a friendship, and a peace evolves uh, from this circumstance and from this battle. So we get to the end fight scene where they lay this trap and they're gonna they're gonna blow this thing up, and uh, they they state very clearly, Mando does that the only sensitive or soft spot on this thing is the belly, you know, so we're going to have to get it to come outside and we're going to bury all these explosives in the ground. Then we're going to, you know, blow it up from the bottom and, and kill it. So they're able to kind of get that. They get it out. They blow it up. Uh, it goes back in the sand. And then, uh, you know, they're like, I don't think it's dead. And then it does something kind of work. It comes out of the mountain, out of the mountain top, you know, and which makes for a really cool shot. But I'm reminded of another movie, Tremors. You know, in Tremors, those uh, sandworms could move through the loose soil that covered the, the desert floor, but they couldn't go through solid rock. And in this episode, it appears to go through solid rock. It's on the top of the mountain now. Now, it leads to a really cool interaction where we have Mando and the Marshal take off. They're both flying, you know, with their Mandalorian armor and, and their, you know, their shoe. <laughs> but then again, I don't know why they were doing that because... Mando already stated the only soft spot is the belly, and this thing, the belly is not exposed, so they're shooting it in the head, and it's not doing anything. So they have to come back down, and it's at this point that this dragon that they're calling it uh, vomits out what I thought was acid. It looks like acid. Uh, it's either burning you know, people or they're drowning in this, this snot. I don't know what it was. So they detonated all the explosives underneath. It didn't kill the thing. They don't know what to do. It's running around killing people. And Mando has an idea. He sees one Bantha that still is loaded down with explosives. And he's going to uh, make some sacrifice and allow himself to be eaten by the dragon. Which kind of plays like, okay, it's a sacrifice. But it's, this is episode one. We know you're not going to die. Uh, but he does a kind of cool trick where he it smacks the tank on uh, on the marshal's uh, jetpack. And he you know, he flies off. And so he's going to stand there. And he's got the bantha. And here comes the dragon. And he eats both of them. And then uh, they go down. So at this point, I was expecting kind of this big boom to, to happen underneath the soil. And you see the dirt. And Mando kind of crawls out. Uh, but no, we get an even more badass scene than that. 
the sandworm dragon comes back out of the ground, mouth open, and Mando shoots out with with lightning electricity. I guess he had launched a some kind of a some kind of a probe or a stun gun or a taser out of his rifle, and uh, and so he just sort of shoots out of the mouth with this electricity all around him, and then he hits his detonator, blowing up the inside of the of the sandworm dragon and killing it, bringing the conflict to a nice tidy resolution. Because remember, I thought that the dragon was vomiting acid which is weird because mando just sort of standing there and he's got this uh, looks like the snot or the goo or whatever so i guess it wasn't acid because if it was acid he would have burned up i mean the, the best car would have the best car steel would have been fine but you know maybe his clothes would have been melted or maybe his rifle or something i don't know but that was a little bit of an inconsistency thing because it makes you sort of say like wait a minute because it looks like earlier in the episode you got tuscan raiders just being melted by this acid but I digress. So then we have the marshal gladly giving over the armor, and uh, they shake hands and say, "Hey, I hope I, our paths will cross again." And it'd be kind of cool to see him. I think that his character, uh, Timothy Ol Oliphant, really played the character. I think well. I think he seemed at times a little out of place. Sometimes the humanoid characters are a little too human, if that makes any sense. Uh, they don't feel alien enough uh, enough to me. But I guess you could say the same thing about you know Han Solo and Luke Skywalker. Princess Leia, you know, Lando Calrissian. Maybe we can see the Marshal come back in a later episode, but, you know, without the Mandalorian armor, I don't know what he really has to offer. I didn't see him do a lot of, like, gunslinging or any kind of special uh, special kind of skill trade. So, uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe this is a one and done, and I'd be okay with that. And the last scene of the episode is Mando speeding away with a twin sun sort of setting in the background, and we see this silhouetted character watch him take off. And it's actually the actor Tamora Morrison. I know I butchered that name. The guy that plays Boba Fett. So Boba Fett's alive. Okay. So I think this is a question that's actually been answered in the EU. I think in the comics and the books. Uh, we know that Boba Fett escaped the Sarlacc pit and he had other adventures. But here we are five years later, six years later, and he's still on Tatooine. So what happened when he got out of the Sarlacc pit? Did it take uh, everything he had to get out of the Sarlacc pit? It was the armor stolen from him? Did he sell it to try to make ends meet? When he got out and he saw that uh, the Jabba was gone and maybe some of his uh, his on-world contacts were, were killed, you know, by by Luke Skywalker and Han Solo, uh, was he kind of marooned on the planet? And then when the Emperor fell or the Empire fell, and the Death Star was was destroyed, did he lose some contacts there and he was just marooned on this planet? I don't know if I believe that. It seems like to me, a guy like Boba Fett would have a lot of contacts. Underground, Empire, Rebellion. He probably have contacts everywhere. So it's to me, it seems a little weird that he's still on the planet. But, you know, maybe they'll discuss that. But I hope they don't spend too much time on it. I don't want to spend a ton of time on it and too little time on it. I don't want it. I don't want him to pop up in the next episode. And it's like, uh, oh, you know, they, they explain it away in like one sentence of dialogue, you know? And on the other hand, I don't want them to spend like two or three episodes just delving into his backstory. I don't think it's necessary. Really, you're talking about five or six years has, has passed. There's not that much has gone on. I mean, we had Obi-Wan Kenobi drop off Luke, and then we didn't see his ass for 19 years later. We're just supposed to assume he was just sitting in his clay hut waiting for the fourth movie to start. Okay, it's time to rank this episode. I'm going to give it a solid 8 out of 10. Great episode. Uh, you know, the visuals are on par. The acting was done very well. The story, for the most part, uh, really worked for me. I like the one-hour format. Maybe this is going to be, uh, hopefully, this is going to be the standard moving forward. And we're going to get good one-hour chunks of good story, things flushed out. Uh, and maybe we won't have some scenes that feel too rushed. But anyway, that's what I think. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. Y'all have a blessed day, and I will see you next time.